And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome back to Globetrotting. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. In the case of Boeing, when it was moving forward with the 787 Dreamliner, after many significant studies, it believed that the type would be game-changing, not just for itself as a company leading into future decades, but acting as a springboard to implement new technologies, then to debut onto other commercial aircraft. But for airlines that would invest in the program as well, they wanted it to be a true new era. The long-haul capabilities matched with the major efficiency jumps needed to be present and make it an ideal aircraft. And while the program has had its struggles, even in coming to market, primarily led on by, say, either Boeing's internal quality problems or even factors outside of their control, such as engine issues, it is a plane that's been adopted widely. So when such a game-changing aircraft enters the industry, most would look towards the competing manufacturer of Airbus for an answer. How would this said manufacturer compete with the new entry into the market? Well, the story of Airbus and their response to the 787, in my opinion, is utterly fascinating. And it's a story I want to tell. I've talked a little bit about it in several past videos and promised a more in-depth one like this. It truly presents a tale of never being so sure of something that it clouds your movement and judgment. Boeing announced its 787, previously known as the 7E7, towards the early stages of the 2000s, and presented the aircraft as basically a solution to airlines' needs of becoming more efficient across long-haul flying, or to cities that were requiring high-capacity aircraft but again, in an efficient manner. Coming in three variants, the plane was considered an advancement on the A330, which had launched in the 1990s at competing Airbus. The Dreamliner was supposed to be the next step in the long-haul market for aircraft, with the latest aerodynamic features that really did bring that efficiency that so many airlines called game-changing. And while that is a term that has been floated around quite frequently, it could really be felt in this case. The aircraft promised to be a game changer, and you'd look back now saying it's delivered on that. Surprisingly, despite the benefits of the 787 that was set to propel airlines forward, Airbus initially didn't see it as a threat to their market share and position within the industry. In hindsight, this could easily be considered quite a shock. However, even at the time, there were some analysts and those on aviation forums that were questioning Airbus's stance on the upcoming Boeing program, creating an air of intrigue. What were Airbus thinking? Well, after putting off any aircraft launch and Boeing continuing to push its 787, it became pretty quickly apparent that Airbus would need to respond, forcing them into a complete 180 and admitting that they were wrong, and the 787 was going to be a true challenger. More and more airlines were either looking to turn their interest into an order that was firm, or more companies were expressing general interest, and as a result, this Dreamliner was very quickly gaining traction. Well, let's begin with Airbus's first response in the form of the A330. Light, a proposed variant basically being a derivative of the A330-200. It would focus on adding engines similar to the 787 with other aerodynamic refinements. This proposition came in time for the 2004 edition of the Farnborough Air Show, but you guessed it, didn't fabricate into anything. In a similar fashion to what would happen nearly a decade later, with Boeing rushing to respond to the A320neo's success, Airbus really faced some something identical with the 787. The input from customers to the European plane maker was it would be ludicrous to not proceed with their own alternative in this long haul market. But furthermore, while Airbus believed a refined A330 would be the best solution for competing with Boeing, there was some hefty pushback. Airlines believed that to align with the clean sheet nature of the 787 and all its relevant improvements, Airbus needed to come out with something that indeed harboured radical improvements on their own, and probably more importantly, something that hadn't previously been seen, yes, in the form of a clean sheet. Several years after the A330 Lite was proposed as the solution, and Airbus was forced to go back to the drawing board, the A350 began gaining traction, with plans initially for a 2010 entry into service. The ambition with this plane was to slot it into the 250 to 300 seat market, which they believed would have considerable growth across the future. Interestingly though, the first iteration of the A350 was criticised just as much as the A330 Lite, and probably didn't attract the reception that Airbus would have initially expected. 
However, in response to this feedback, they, you guessed it, went back to the drawing board. Within 2006, the redesigned A350 XWB, which is what we know it to be today, emerging. And customers flocked to order the plane, including Singapore Airlines. Several variants were slated to come with this plane that would have included a larger fuselage than the first iteration, allowing not just for varied configurations based on airlines' requirements, whether this be high density or low density, density, but because of the XWB naming, it would have a higher capacity. Since entering service, the A350 has indeed been a success, with its multiple variants proving to be hugely favourable with airlines around the world, and this can be for varying degrees of missions. We've seen this through Airbus's ability to push the limits of these planes in the right manner to achieve future missions, such as Qantas's 20-hour Project Sunrise flights, or or even Singapore Airlines A350 ULR, all premium configured jets, which fly on some of the world's longest journeys. Maybe it is domestically configured jets. It really reassures the industry of this plane's versatility. And the upcoming A350F that will launch later this decade is another reason for companies in the industry to love the plane. Despite the success enjoyed, the A350 series is a pretty interesting tale in my opinion. It reminds us to always watch what's occurring in the rearview mirror, whether you're a business owner or in your day-to-day -day job, even school. Never take your position for granted. I know I don't. And if the response hadn't come from Airbus, well, we'd have to question what the industry would have looked like today. Likely very different. And while the A350 launched in response to the 787, it's important to note that the A350 can't be considered a direct competitor to the 787. They are very different aircraft. Purely what the A350 was able to do was position customers with another long-haul option, and in turn, the A350 has been able to compete with not just the older 777, but the upcoming 777X, and for some customers, they're willing to take that jump up to the A350 over the Dreamliner. This entire situation that I've been discussing, some would argue is what is actually occurring today with Boeing, but in the middle of the market sector. The only difference being that Boeing has not just ceded ground, but they know they won't be coming back with a competitive aircraft, or should I say an alternative, like Airbus did two decades prior with their A350. It's a warning sign for the future and why aircraft manufacturers have to continuously study each other to make sure they don't lose ground in key markets, whether that be short haul, the middle ranged area, or in your long haul flying. So that's the very fascinating story of Boeing Airbus and the 787 and the A350. What do you think Airbus was thinking when Boeing launched their 787 and they didn't truly see it as a threat and then essentially very quickly were trying to get something to market to compete? Let me know down below in the comments. Thank you very much for your support here on the channel. Take care, be safe, and I'll see you in a couple of days for more aviation analysis. And we'll fly.